Hey, 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 hey. Uh, I am truly excited to be here tonight with none other than these generals, these great guys. These are some awesome men, uh, men of God, solid guys in the community, solid guys within their own capacity, doing something some amazing that's who has inspired and encouraged me in their own way. I'm truly excited to have a conversation um, tonight with them. Um, we have a... a we have on our line, we have uh, Bishop Tyrone Smith. We have uh, Pastor Kenneth Brown. We have Dr. Gallup Franklin, Dr. Oscar Venezy, Dr. Derek McGee. All these gentlemen, y'all just, we just excited to be here with you guys, man. Like, uh, tell me, tell me, tell me. Uh, we, we're excited for Vision Board. Um, this conversation is just simple tonight. Just talking about Vision Board casting. Um, so we can kind of like do a forecast of what's to come on the fifth. So we ain't got to get too deep into whatever. If it Lord leads you, you want to get that deep, get a shovel and I get the dog going, um, the pail and I, I have to get it, get it going like, uh, like everybody else. So, um, we're going to start off with a, a few questions. Um, I think we all should just, uh, Hey, Dr. Young, how are you? Man of God, glad to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's my pastor. That's my pastor. I'm good and bad. That's my pastor, y'all. <laughs> uh, first question I just want to ask um, everybody going to have a chance to let me know if you need, a, uh, need me to repeat the question is as it relates to having a vision, I'm not saying anybody's old on the line or young. I'm just saying you guys are very, you know, have you got your character thing going on. So as it relates to vision, what are some things that you would tell your 18 year old self now we all you know from 18 a minute ago and so at 18 that's graduating from high school that used to transition to trade school transition to college transition to kind of like that blah area trying to transition to the army navy military any capacity what would you tell yourself at 18, with all that you've been through now, just go back and say, hey, hey, don't worry about it. What would you say? Um, uh, Mr. Tyrone Smith, what would you say to your younger self, brother? Oh, man, uh, good evening, all. I am so absolutely excited to be here. Um, I'm going to be brief and short, not real deep. What I would tell the 18-year-old me um, is uh, vision requires voice. Real simple. Don't have vision and not have a voice. Get it out of your head, right, and into your atmosphere. That's what I tell the 18-year-old me. I love that, man. Uh, vision, vision, you got to have a voice. Use a voice. Um I, I really want to kind of unpack that a little bit because <laughs> if you have some 18 year olds watching the 18 year old, he's like, I got a voice. I hear voices all the time in my head. What are you, what are you talking about? I got my mama voice on one side, my daddy voice on another side, my grandma saying this. What voice should I'm I'm looking for? What 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 what's pulling on me? What how can I separate this voice over any other voice? What what are you, when you say that to an 18 year old, what does that mean? It means give your dream a voice. Um, many times we all have dreams. We all have places that we see ourselves. Um, however, um, we're often the last ones to actually speak it out loud. You got it? And I, I challenge everybody, you know, to take the time and ask yourself, uh, when was the last time you had plans? Not that you told somebody else, but in your meditation time, in your hoping and dreaming for it, when was the last time you actually said what you're believing for, what you desire to see? When was the last time you told it to you? All right. Have you ever given voice to your dreams? It's a powerful thing. And I found out that nine out of 10 people have never actually given voice to their vision. So what you see yourself doing, who you see yourself becoming, um, will you dare to speak it? Will you dare to say it out loud? And if you dare to say it out loud, um, you will find a series of events will start to align themselves to give you the ideas and opportunities to actually manifest what it is you see. All right. So a lot of people, the difference between their vision dying and, and their vision um, um, coming to, to, to realization is their boldness 
to actually say it, you know, to actually say it. And so I train and teach and coach people all the time. Um, you know, you can want to be a doctor, all right? Dr. Franklin's on the line. All right, you can want to be a doctor, but if you can't dare to pull yourself to actually call yourself a doctor in the now time, like let your let your ears hear your voice calling you who you are in a future moment. All right. Let your ears hear your voice calling you who you are in a future moment. If you don't do that, you'll never bring vision into present. You'll hear the rest at I Will Not Perish 2022. I love it, man. I love it. Uh, it's one thing that you said a while ago, I think a year or two ago, and you said, what if, because you know, a lot of times that voice in our head, you had to give a Bible study, and this thing went viral on social media. There's a positive viral thing that said, what if it all goes right? I'm going to throw my phone right now. Absolutely. I don't care what anybody looking. What if <laughs> it all goes right? Um, because a lot of times we plan out if it goes wrong, but how many times we get ready for the celebration and say, what if? It all goes right, but goes all goes right. Hey, brother Brown, my brother from another been we've been kicking for a minute. All right now. <laughs> so uh the question is, man, what would you tell your 18 year old self as it relates to vision? I know oh. you're smooth and everything, so you know, I'm not getting into all of that. <laughs> so so vision, vision should do three things, not only three things, but for me, vision did or does three things. It defines who you want to be. Uh it also uh, what you wanted to be known for. And it sets, it's a set of experiences and accomplishments that you're aiming for. And so that's the framework to evaluate and manage those, that particular uh, thing that we call vision. Uh, and I would tell my 18 year old self, or, or if I can go back to tell, you know, talk to young people or which I do, I tell my 18 year old self is continue to work on being you. Um, and that's discovering all facets of you, the good, the bad, the indifferent. So I'm a counselor by trade. That's my, that's my profession. Uh, the average age that I counsel, I would say the average age is about 55, 60. And with that age group, you would be amazed at how many people are still struggling with the fact of coming to the knowledge of who they are, their purposes in life their vision. They have the bank accounts, they have the, the homes, they have the cars, they they have the, the great marriages, and they're still struggling with, I'm, 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 they're still struggling with who they are. And so what I would tell people, the 18 year old is, it's okay to, to discover all facets of yourself. The good, see, we, we, we are okay with the good, but we, we question the, the, the bad or the indifferent. We don't want to, we don't want to go into those great areas and it's okay. I, I say this and you guys have heard it millions of times. We've said it, we've heard it. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay. Not working on not being okay. And so that's what I would tell. That That's man. That is uh, so good, man. You, 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 that going back to tell yourself, it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to still work on yourself. That's a big thing, man, because at 18, you know, uh, that's going out, that's partying, that's uh, hanging out with friends, that kind of like, hey, Ma, I'm graduated now. Now, now it's my turn to kind of turn up, do my own thing um, or whatever. And sometimes as young men, um, we have that. Uh, it's so easy to follow and go alone and when you follow and go along, you are forsaking the opportunity to your best gift you ever had. And that is your identity. And if we ever yield time to understanding the benefits of just being myself, even if it called me to be by myself, we will make it to a, a, a place, an you know, apex in God and, and our, and, you know, and just mature and develop on a whole different level. Because um, we have. Uh, my wife and I have an 18 year old. So one, one of the most amazing things that I admire about him is learning to be by himself and being okay. That I'm, I'm not lonely. I'm not drilled. I'm not, I'm not going through the unlisted unwanted emotions, but I'm good. You know? So that's a beautiful thing. You're absolutely right. Um, my brother from another Dr. Oscar, what would you tell your 18 year old self, man? Like you, you your story, um, 
man, I you, y'all got to come to the fifth man because these these gentlemen, it, it, it's they only doing a snippet, like they're scratching the surface. Seriously, they're only scratching the surface, man, because all of them got a story to unpack, and they're not in a story where it's, it's sad pays on lifetime, but they're they're in a celebrate on um, celebrate celebratory stage in their life where they can be like, oh my God, I'm I'm good, I'm great, I know how to ebb and flow, I know what this thing called life is all about now, so um just like my good friend and brother dr oscar man just tell us what you tell your 18 year old self oh man i i tell you i i I had the perfect answer but listening to uh these other leaders talk man i don't i don't wrote down some notes for myself to go back and tell my 40 some year old self Um, (laughs) just amazing knowledge i i really thought i had the secret but i i see a lot of these brothers on the call all understand what that means you know, when I when I think back to my 18 year old self, um, I I I would have I would have never thought that I would be at the point that I am today. So, one of the things I would tell myself is, uh, go ahead and believe. You know, go ahead and believe that you can achieve absolutely anything in the world. Um, the only thing I was really good at when I when I was 18 is persistence. So that is how I achieved anything that I achieved all the way up to 18 years old. And I took that persistence um, into everything I did until I understood the power in um, a vision. And I'll tell you everything I do um, is, is, is I, I, saw, I surround my, myself in something that reminds me of what my vision is. If you, even if you look back here at my wall, you know, I have a farm. I have a nonprofit. I remind myself to, to hustle hard. I remind myself to inspire. I, I my 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 uh, kids like dinosaurs. My, my grandkids like dinosaurs. So I I always remember to think about family and everything I do. So when I go on a on a, a a VC, you're gonna know that I own a nonprofit called Protect Me. When you when I go on a VC, you're gonna know I'm a global traveler and global investor. Everything I have, everything I do starts with some level of vision because I'm just not smart enough to to build a strategy out to accomplish those things. So what I have to do is put them out visually so God understands where I'm trying to move. You know, I'm just not educated enough. I'm I'm not a doctor. I'm not a you know, I didn't go the traditional route At, at 19 years old. I was on the bottom of the ocean trying to figure out how to be myself. So. I, I'm just not, you know, I didn't take that sort of traditional route. So when I start understanding, if I take a $10,000 check and put it on the board and put a Mercedes by it, and I keep looking at it, like I remember when I was, I was, uh, I was in my thirties and, and I, I had terrible, I had a terrible credit score, couldn't pay two bills. If, if you, you line them up and put them in order and, I mean, I just didn't do it. It was I was in the Navy. I was having a great time and I just wouldn't pay my bills. But one day I put a ten thousand dollar check and, and this sounds low. Right. Because I was too I was too afraid to put forty thousand and I put a Mercedes right next to it. I didn't even know how much the Mercedes cost. But by the time I start really looking at the type of cars I wanted, I could afford that Mercedes and it didn't make sense for me to get it anymore. So two things. Believe and start your vision now. And I guarantee you, you will outpace everybody. I don't care what your grade point average is. I don't care how many felonies you got. I don't care how many times you failed because I don't believe in failure. You either win or you learn and you keep it moving. I love it, man. I, it's so much to unpack from there. I'm I'm not even going to try to stress the surface. One thing that you said that was really good to me, you said at 19, I was under at the bottom of the ocean. And I've learned, I heard this um, story before, and it was about um, if you plant a bamboo tree, seed form, for five years and five months, it does nothing on top of the ground. I'm going to throw this phone in a second. <laughs> but on the sixth year, the, the, six, the five year to six month, it grows for five weeks straight, over 90 feet tall. And what you just said helped me remind me that story because it's let me know that before anything grows over, it grows under first. And so having that foundation and knowing what, you, what you've what you been through to get where you are now is an amazing thing. Um, my good friend and brother, I don't even, if you play golf, 
if you got headaches, uh, <laughs> Dr. Gallup Franklin, man, he he's some in like, look, Dr. A. Franklin, uh, man, he 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 do some everything. So I I don't even, I don't even want to unfold it. Uh, just tell me, uh, Gallup, what would you tell your 18 year old self? 18, I think we're scratching the surface over there at uh, I'm thinking now, you can tell me if I'm wrong over at the uh, highest of seven hills. Uh, <laughs> and we go strike, strike, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you got the floor, brother. No, I appreciate it. Great to be here. Great to see so many phenomenal minds and people and good friends like Bishop Smith on the call. Always great to be a part of whatever you have going on, Nick. But yeah, at 18, that, that's a tough one. Uh, when I think back, we talk about visions. Oftentimes, when, you, when you've when seen the bottom of the bottom, you become very ambitious. You become very, very driven. You kind of forget to take time to just smell the coffee, right? And so you start just, just really trying to be the best that you be you can be and work as hard as you can possibly work. But you don't give some time for yourself to understand like, okay, maybe I should travel some. Maybe I should be able to hang out with some friends sometimes. And so to my 18 year old self, honestly, I would actually tell myself to chill out a little bit, right? Hang out a little bit more, enjoy life just a little bit more. Um, because you start realizing what's interesting is you, you start getting ad addicted to desiring something. And then once you accomplish it, you start looking towards the next goal, right? And when that happens, when you're ambitious and you're driven and you're hardworking, you start finding yourself in this rat, that, this rat race, essentially, right? Where you're always working, always looking for the next thing, always trying to help others. And oftentimes you leave yourself kind of flat. And so you start thinking, wow, you know, 10 years later, you've been working hard and you look up and say, well, what have I done for myself lately? Like I'm doing all these things for other people. I'm always trying to do what I can for the community. I'm always trying to do what I can for my future family. But what have I done to enjoy my life in today's space and celebrate myself essentially to kind of help myself kind of continue to go to go on? So to my 18 year old self, I would say kind of relax a little bit more. Uh, they say what well, they say, you know, take some time to, to smell the coffee. Um, also understand that you have to really enjoy the accomplishment more than the pursuit of that accomplishment. You know, there's that high, right? When you have that Mercedes on the, the refrigerator, that's what's driving you every single day. And then once you get the Mercedes, you look over and what do you want? Maybe a Porsche or, or, or a Ferrari or something else. And so you're always trying to stay ambitious and you're always trying to push yourself to the next level. But you don't take time to really celebrate yourself for those milestones that you're having and really celebrating with those around you and really also thinking and taking time to, to smell the coffee, right? So that's what I would actually say to my uh, 18 year olds. So um, Dr. Gallup would say, enjoy the ride. Um, enjoy the enjoy ride. ride. Don't put too much. You know how many, I cut a lot of hair, you know, I've been mentoring for a minute, man. It's so many kids are stressing for like, like old men. And I'm not, and, and I'm not saying in a way where I'm trying to be funny, but in a way where like literally, they like, I told someone today, he said, man, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. I'm like, is your conversation always going to be about worry, doc? We got that. Yeah. I don't know. You need to go see Brother Brown, man. I, I, I can't deal with it. What you need? You know, I need to kind of like, you know, you got a lot going on. So you absolutely right, man. Just going back and telling yourself, like, just relax, just calm down. Um, um, we we um, parenting um, younger 18 year olds at this age with one thing that we didn't have that wasn't a major thing was social media. And so you're you're parenting from a place and space that you did not experience. So that should help with the emotional intelligence side of it, understanding how to ensure that you're not parent from a judgmental standpoint and say, hey, you did that way, but we didn't have that person that they got. So you're absolutely right that um, just relax and just enjoy the ride, uh, but also not forsaking the accountability. Dr. McGee. What would you say your 18 year old self? I know at that time, you know, you out here, you know, you're on top of the tip of the Mount Everest right now. So I don't know. I started off in the valley. I don't know what you said. I've just been. <laughs> so um, at 18, I left Los Angeles and came to Tallahassee to go to fam. And at 18, I wasn't thinking about God trusting me to plant a church wasn't thinking about lobbying. I wasn't thinking about starting my own business. I was thinking about envisioning being the first, the first one in my family to go to college and graduate. Uh, that was the vision. And I, I left and went across the country because I wanted to go to an HBCU and 
didn't come from financial means that would support the vision that I believe God gave me. Um, so what I, I would tell my 18 year old self, looking back on it now, it, was, it would be three things that and those three things I would hold fast to in every vision God has given me that he has blessed me to be able to see fruition in all three of these things that I would tell myself at 18. I would tell myself today at 44. And the first one is, is um, it's bigger than you, but not bigger than God. It's bigger than you, but not bigger than God. And if you have an idea that you can pay for right now, it's not a vision. It's not a vision at all. If you can go to your bank account right now and withdraw the money and personally fund that, it's not a vision. If that if that vision doesn't require you to really have to lean and trust and ask God to to make this thing make sense and come to pass, then it's not a vision. So the first thing I would tell myself is is bigger than you, but not bigger than God. Right. When you have no one in your family that has done what you desire to do and envision doing when there is no blueprint that you can follow in your familial history. And so. But you know, this is what God has said. When you come to Tallahassee from Los Angeles with two hundred dollars in cash, five suitcases and an acceptance letter, and that's all you have. No family, no friends in that city. Don't know anybody. But, you know, this is where God told you to be. I would tell myself that the second thing I would tell myself is God will provide. He will provide when when you are hungry and and the vision seems um, so too far to reach and your money is nowhere close to where it needs to be um, and contemplating giving up and walking away, I would tell myself at 18, God will provide. And the last thing I would tell myself, and, and I would tell myself this after being burned so many times is don't trust everyone with what has been given to you. The vision God gave you cannot be trusted to be told to everybody. And, 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 after being burned a lot of times, I've come to the realization that you have to protect that vision with everything that's in you. You have to allow the Lord to speak to you and let you know um, whom to share it with and how much of it to share with with those individuals. I'll give you a quick example. Not just when I left to come to college, but when the Lord gave me the vision to plant a church, um, I went through three years where only one person in those three years knew anything about the vision God gave me. Um, number one, I was battling with it. But number two is because I said this to my church last night in our Bible study. Sometimes people's words are more detrimental than the diagnosis. And if you're not careful, people will use their words because they don't have enough faith to see the manifestation. They'll instantly start speaking out of their ignorance and they'll try to speak death to your vision. And if you're not careful and if you're not mature and disciplined enough, you allow their words to begin to negate what God birthed into you. And so you have to learn. I have to learn. This is what I would tell myself. You, you can't trust everybody. You can't. Even your closest friends, they can't handle this because this thing is so big. Right. This thing is so big, big. And at the end of the day, what a vision is, 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 is God putting a seed in your hand and letting you know that your hand is not big enough to handle this manifestation. But I'm still going to do it anyway. And, and, and that's that's what it is. And that's what I would tell myself, man, again, is that it's, it's bigger than you. but It's not bigger than God. Number two is God will provide. And number three is don't trust everyone with, with, with what God has given you. Um, and, and that's family, too. That's family as well. Man, I don't come from a family where we had a lot of entrepreneurs in our family and things of that nature, man. So some of the business ideas I had, my family would have laughed me to scorn. They could they never would have seen it. You know, I didn't come from a, a family, a, a church background where. The pastor pastored the church and also was an entrepreneur. Right. He was 100 percent dependent upon the church. And, and I'm not knocking that. But at the same point, I believe in multiple streams of income. And so I'm never I was never going to be beholden to one stream altogether. But in order to do that right, you have to have some character, some integrity. And so that's also what I tell myself at 18 is is men work on your character. Work on your character. Be OK. Like as as you were saying about your son, Nick, be OK with being by yourself because there's some things God is doing in you. Um, and God has shown me years later that the things that I went through at 18, God was preparing me for what he was going to do for me 20 years later. It didn't make sense then, man, when 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 you're broken hearted, people betrayed you. But now when you see the manifestation and the people who did you wrong 20 years ago 
are still struggling to get somewhere and you already have surpassed that, it all makes sense, man. But but um, character is necessary also for visions manifestation. You know, God is not going to bring manifestation to a vision if, if he can't trust your character to give him what's due to him and do right by other people. What's your cash app? <laughs> <laughs> What's your cash up, Doc? It, I, I am not gonna touch that, man. It, it, that's ah, man, um, really, really beautiful thing. Uh, that that one, especially the one we say, don't trust your friends and all that type. Because you know, a lot of times we make decisions. Well, my friend do this, and subconsciously you compare your household at that eighteen to someone else's household. You're script. They let their kids do this and that whatever. Nope, nope. <laughs> so I do get it. Uh, a um, good brother, Doctor Chester Brown. I'm already upset. I ain't got these these um, these uh, golden, heavily nuggets you been dropping. So you gonna drop some gems now? Hold on, let me get a bucket real quick. <laughs> <laughs> How y'all doing? Doing good, man. Great, great. Good to be on. It's great to be on. Um, I think the question uh, the question is uh, when you're dealing with vision. I, I apologize for being late. Uh, but um, the question directly is, my, Bishop, sir, eighteen-year-old self. Yeah. What would what would I tell my eighteen-year-old self? Uh, I I think I preached a sermon not too long ago uh, about that. Um, that was uh, kind of centered around something Gail King did uh, when they used to have a documentary uh, moment on CBS this morning, and. Um, and I really can't remember exactly what, what it was called, but it was very shaped in that, that same format, uh, the old you talking to the young you. And, um, but honestly, what I would tell, I think what I would tell my 18-year-old self, my 45-year-old self would tell my 18-year-old self, I would tell myself to slow down, plan ahead, connect, don't be afraid to connect with people who are going where I'm growing. Um, connect with people who have a, their words, uh, their words line up with their walk. If I could tell my 18 year old self something, I would tell myself um, to push yourself to grow authentically and not hide behind your gift. Um, because I realized, um, man, when I was 18, my gift was a decoy. I had not grown into my anointing yet. My character had not caught up with my uh, anointing. And so I would have, um, I, I, would, I would have pushed myself to grow authentically. I also, during that time, uh, 18 years old, man, I would have, I would have sat down and asked my dad some the hard questions, um, not the easy questions, but the hard questions, um, and I kind of let him slip away uh, and didn't ask the hard questions. And so uh, now, uh, I wish I would have done that at 18, versus still having questions and discovering. Um, a lot of generational traits at in my 40. You know, I think I could have broken generational curses much easier. I don't, I don't know if I'm talking the right talk. Uh, I just got on, so. uh, but uh, uh, I, I would I would have done I would have I would have told my 18 year old self spend more time with your dad, not just riding and fishing, but uh, spend those valuable moments asking the hard questions uh, as a son to his father, so that you can. Um, better safeguard your seed, the next generation, and not pass, uh, not be more prone to pass um, toxic uh, pathological things down to your next generation. So you find yourself uh, in, in, in my older age, uh, in my 30s and 40s, oh, you know, the, the light bulb comes on and you got a fight on your hand because now um you, you're trying you, you're trying to shut those ports and shut those doors um you know uh, you found you've got it under control but dog you know your children are struggling so you know don't be afraid to, to, to ask your dad the, 
the real hard questions. And 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 I think lastly, um, man, this this is a this is a big one for me because I was in leadership uh, around 18, uh, 18, 19, I was in leadership in heavy leadership. So I would tell that 18 year old young Chester Brown the third, I would tell him that it's God's job, not your job to make a vision come to pass. Um, it's my job to prepare myself for uh, it, it's my job to prepare myself for what God is going to do and not take God's job in trying to make what he showed me happen. Spend my time growing into what he showed me and growing and grooming and goaling myself, not wasting time uh, hurting relationships and 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 making young person errors trying to make a vision happen when the Lord said it's one appointed time and it shall speak and it shall not lie. So if I said it, I'm going to do it. That ain't got nothing to do with me. It has to do with now me, if I'm my 18 year old self, telling my 18 year old self, hey boy, work on you so that when the appointed time comes, you are ready for it. I guess that's all. <laughs> I tell you, about, well, well, um, one of the things that you said that's very key that a lot of 18 year olds have a hard time doing is communicating um, and building those connections. Like uh, the simple things, they walk in the room, they they on their phone, you know, they go to, if you go to a social event, they kind of stay with the same people. I'll do that, that family, that family reunion mindset. You know, you go with the, you hang around the people you roll with. No, you're supposed to actually get out and mingle, have conversation, network. Um, so you, you're absolutely right. Um, the power of communication and connection is what um, definitely um, raise your awareness and your um, ability to grow much faster than, you know, the average. Um, Pastor Young, what would you tell your 18 year old self? Um, unmute yourself, Pastor. Oh, okay. It's still muted. I'm good mm -hmm. now? Yes. I think, listen, everyone has really said a whole lot of my heart, but to sum it up for me, to tell my 18-year-old self, I think it would be surround myself with the right people, not just people that uh, believe in my vision, but people that, because I needed to staff my weaknesses. Um, I wasn't, hadn't always trusted everybody, but instead, I think that I tried to do a lot by myself and in trying to do it by myself, I needed to surround myself with people, the, the weaknesses, my weaknesses, my my strength is vision. My strength is, is casting vision and running with the vision, but not the organizational pieces. So surrounding myself with that administrative, that, that administrative leader, surrounding yourself with the right people, I think would be key. If I could tell my 18 year old self one other thing, I think it would be this man of God, if, if nothing else is making sure that in this hour, I am okay with being original and who God created me to be. Uh, my authenticity was a strength, but then I was looking for reaffirmation from other people when God had already affirmed me and who I was. And so I was too busy trying to be Bishop Jakes when I needed to just be old as young and let God fine tune old as young. And so now somewhere around 40, I've realized that uh -huh. I can't, nobody, can't nobody beat me being old as young. I am original, uniquely old as young, and I need to stay in the vein of old as young. If I try to hoop like Chester Brown, I'm going to make a fool of myself because only God can hoop like that. If I try to <laughs> She's like Derek McGee. If I try to execute like Kenny Brown, if I try to come on to go for like Ty Smith, but I can only be oldest young and God need to work on oldest young and allow God for my place of originality and be okay with being who God has called for me to be. Hey, Amen. I spent snippet, time trying to be like snippet. everybody else. Snippets. He said snippets, not a, a snippet. snippet. I, I tried to hoop like Chester Brown and I almost had an aneurysm. <laughs> I, I'm almost yes, <laughs> Y'all stop picking on me. Yeah. I can't fall like that. I can't. I tried. I tried. I tried. <laughs> that was good. Man, um, that was good. The greatest gift that God will ever give you is your own identity. Yes, sir. If we ever learn to plant, posture, and place ourselves in the position on and honor that our own identity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nobody ever be able to do it like you. Only time we become a loser is when we get in somebody else's lane. 
<laughs> we mind other people's business. We trying to do it just like everybody else, just like you said. So you are absolutely right. And that's why I said early, man, that following thing is something else. Um, we we'll keep it right alone. And um, we're going to ask one more question and then kind of flow a little. Um, now, when did having a vision for your life was more than a phrase, it became a practice? It, 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 you you wasn't yielding time just saying, you know, I got vision, I got vision, but your life looking the same. You still hang around the same people. You still doing the same thing. You still laying in the bed longer time, you know, whatever. When did the shift happen and say, you know what, let me take over. Now, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Um, uh, I love his story because this thing hit me so good. I love it. Uh, Oscar Vinicy, man, he, he said when I was down in the bottom of the ocean. And he would realize he was doing something. Uh, uh, uh. It's much. It, it's it's way more like that out here than washing dishes. <laughs> yeah, Go man. Ahead, uh, it, it's it's funny because my first job was washing dishes on on, on a on a nuclear power submarine um, um, at the bottom of the ocean. So, I, I you know, when did having a vision? You know what? To be honest with you, it was always there. Right. And, and throughout my life, there there has been been people who at times will label you right to say, hey, you you can't you, you you're not able to uh, we, we grade you at this level. Um, you, you qualify for these particular things. But there's always a dissatisfaction in everyone, you know, and, and, and a, a lot of times I, I talk to teens about. I think uh, I can't remember who, who spoke about this, but they talked about growing authentically. And and what I what I found myself doing is coming back, blocking out all those uh, those labels that folks had given me and my vision start to open up. Right. I was I was dissatisfied. So I had to go find something to fill that void because the the vision is born inside of you and you're, you're capable of achieving anything anywhere. If you listen, if you find somewhere to block out the noise and just listen at what's already invested in you, it, it, it doesn't require any sort of, 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 um, of requirements to unlock that particular vision, except listening. And uh, one other person says, so, man, I've been writing down notes all day. This this is the first time I, I've been on a call where I, I had a, a bunch of notes to write down. But they talked about, OK, with, you know, being bad. Um, OK, with be the bad. And I, I think Mr. McGee talked a little bit about working on your character. I mean, those are all the, the, the things you got to do to unlock that vision and, and, and find it to be important. So when I got tired of getting in trouble, and it and God will let you continue to get in trouble until you learn. And when I got tired of getting in trouble and tired of, tired of explaining why someone who had achieved these things was in this particular situation, then I, I had no choice. So I start believing in that vision and start believing that I could achieve anything in the world, no matter what happened. You know, a lot of times us as black men, we we wake up in the morning time and just run to 7-Eleven, run to the store, run to the bank, and you face with these unbelievable, invisible obstacles, right? I don't care if it's an encounter with the bank teller. I don't care if it's an encounter with the police. You, you're met with this constant, you are bad. You are not worthy. You cannot achieve the best things in the world. Well, I, I, I did sort of like uh, uh, Pastor Brown. I want to call him Chester because that's 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 how I know him from back in the day. But uh, with all due respect, I, I, I was leaning on every word you said. You know, um, you you gotta you gotta you gotta block some of that stuff out, and you got you gotta go find yourself. You gotta work on your character, and and it'll unlock. It'll unlock. The only thing I tell high schoolers today, or people that's trying to achieve things, is is Unlock, uh, unlock, grow authentically, and you have an opportunity to change the world. And I'll tell you this last thing, and I'll let it go. I love talking to 18-year-old years, 18 year old folks at this point, or anybody that's trying to achieve anything, no matter what their circumstances are, 
because we are like on the new industrial revolution, except it is a tech revolution. So in terms of de determining what your vision is, setting your vision, it can be anything because the world is not, uh, is not educating or teaching towards what this world will look like in five years. So you have an opportunity to go ahead and set a new vision for yourself, unlock your vision, I don't care what your age is, and, and, and set a new destiny for yourself because there are thousands of jobs that will be on the market in the next five years that don't even exist today. So nobody can't really tell you what you can't be because they don't really understand what this world is gonna look like in the next five years. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, a gallop. Uh, when did it happen for you? When did the transition of thought to say, you know what, I'm just not going to just, it's not just a board that I've done. It's not a mental space because most men operate up here and we can see things up here, but we don't actually write it down. Sometimes we don't plan it out thoroughly out loud or be inclusive mm -hmm. and give legs to it or anything in that regard. But what, 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 what happened? What was did anything happen? What was the transition for you to go from I have vision as a phrase versus I'm operating in practice? That's that's a good one because you're right. I mean, it's, it's great to be a visionary and have an idea, you know, have an idea of where you want to go. But the question is always, what's your plan? I don't know if anybody's here ever tried to drive somewhere without directions, right? You know, going to California with no directions, not knowing I-10 or 75, what's your plan? How do you get there? And so, you know, people always say that even the road to hell is paved with good intentions. If you have a vision, but no type of plan on how to execute to get there, unfortunately, you won't, you won't end up there, right? You might end up in Miami instead of California, New York instead of California. And so one thing I've always tried to do is have an idea of where I'm trying to go and then surround myself with people that have already done it or do a lot of reading about people who've already done it. So oftentimes, you know, people like me, I, I might not have grown up knowing any pharmacist. I might not have grown up knowing any real estate developers. But what I started doing was just Googling, using the internet and reading about their lives and things they did and what they might have accomplished. And you'll be surprised, even though that mentor might not be a mentor that talks to you every day or someone you can reach out to, you start to try to model yourself and emulate maybe things they've done in their lives and, and steps that they've taken, reading their books, understanding how they think, listening to the podcast and understanding who they are and why they are who they are. And so I think it's important just to realize that it's not just about the vision. The vision's great, but that's just the painting of the picture. But you got to have a plan to understand how to get there. And then you have to have the discipline to execute that plan. There's only a, a small difference between those people who are successful and not so successful. And that's having the discipline to sit down and execute. You know, I hear people come to me all the time with these great, phenomenal business ideas. And I always say, you know what, this might sound weird, but yeah, you're very brilliant with this great idea. But the hardest part isn't coming up with the idea. It's actually executing the idea. You're absolutely right, man. That is... Uh... A lot of times it's the difference between the good and the great is having the discipline. Like I, I, I tell people all the time, starting is one part of the battle, um, but sustaining, <laughs> sustaining and staying in the fight um, is another part of it. Um, Bishop Ty, what was the transition point for you, man? Tell me, tell me. Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> I had a really great mom. Um, a lot of people say, uh, it takes a man to teach a man how to be a man. Um, had a mom and a, a, a good stepfather who's the only father I knew. Uh, but my mom, my mom um, did something um, at the age of 13. I, I was about 13 years old. And my mom sat my sister, my older sister, older brother and myself down. And she said uh, to to me, she says, because um, my, my sister is about six years older than I am. So she was about 19 years old. And she looked at us and she says, please understand that according to the law, by the age of 18, I can legally put you out of my house. Now, what you do after that is really up to you. And um, that moment for me as a 13 year old kid, I'm thinking like, what would I really do 
if I became homeless at the age of 18 years old, you know, so, so it came from that place, but, but my mom instilled in me a care, a care, not only for myself, but for others. And one thing I learned is you really can't, can't receive and unlock the vision that God placed in you and sent you to the earth with until you mature to a place of caring. Um, in the book of Genesis chapter 12, we find that one of the first men God ever gave vision to was Abram. And, and he says to Abram, listen, leave your country, your kinsmen and your father's house, right? And then I'll make you, right, a great nation. I'll bless you and all this good stuff, right? So this departure has to take place. However, the issue came for me in that story was um, Abram is childless. So God's promising him um, this to be this father of many nations, right? But he has no children at all. And I've learned that often vision is birth is birth out of the place of, of, of deficit, all right, what we don't have. And so in the same likeness, that's what I saw. When my mom uh, shared that with me, she was bringing me mentally to a place of saying, what do you have? And when it comes down to caring, when it comes down to developing heart um, for yourself first, right? Because we got to learn how to be healthy for us before we could be healthy for anybody else. So for me, um, there was a responsibility that I took on to say, wait a minute, am I going to be healthy for myself? All right. Am I going to be healthy for myself first? And then once being healthy enough for me, then now what am I really called to do? All right. A lot of people are seeking calling, but I learned that God's, God's language is in picture form. So when God talks to the average one of us, he doesn't talk to us in words. He talk to, talks to us in pictures. And that pictures is that vision that we're talking about right now. He tells Abram, he says, look up at the stars and look down at the sands. Your children will be all right, as the stars and the sands. So he gives, he gives Abram this vision, all right, something to look at. And it is Abram's ability to look at the stars and the sands. Watch this. In times that are good, he holds his head up. My God, and he can see the stars and he's reminded of God's promises. But in times that are bad, he looks down. All of us have hung down here tight days. But in looking down, he envisions the sands and he's still reminded of the promise of what God told him. So watch this. Between the time that God says it and the time that it happens, he experiences um, um, the, 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 the stealing or taking of his wife, you got it. Um, the departure of Lot, the kidnap, the rescue mission. He goes through all of these obstacles before he ever sees the first sign of what God promised. And in many cases, um, when, when you talk about what motivates vision, it is knowing what God said, right? before the obstacles and then keeping it in mind during the obstacles. And so for me, um, I, I got a story. I got something called faith shoes, man. I have the shoes that um, I went to college in and went to work in and they have holes in the bottom. And I would literally, I I'd go to college and, and I had to go straight to work. And then I end up going and preach a revival or teach a Bible study and things of that nature. And one day I was praising God. You know, I'm from the noisy crew. So I, I was giving him a good old shout of praise. And, and I was lifting up my feet. And uh, and and my pastor uh, messed around and saw the holes in the bottom of my shoes. She called me in the meeting and she says, listen, you can't be preaching to people with holes in your shoes. You got it. So I went and I put some card, card, cardboard paper in the bottom of my shoes because I was watch this. I was working toward what I saw inside of me 
even when it didn't appear outside of me. And I think that's the major issue that most people um, give up short of the goal that they're set. Because while while we are giving all these images outside of us, we we kind of miss holding the imagery inside of us. And that's the major thing for me. So I'm grateful for 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 the the devices, for the depreciations, for what I didn't have, because what I didn't have made room for what God had for me. And and many times we find that I'm 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 done with this one, right? But but many times we find that people who are given too much often lack dream. They lack vision because they've been afforded everything and and have not gone without the proper things that would unveil the desire in order for them to see what God put in them. First of all, I'm just going to tell you to sit back, okay? <laughs> I'm just just, just say that. <laughs> if you came a little bit closer while I'm telling you, I said, God, no, it, it won't let him sit down. That was powerful. Uh, that was powerful. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have no words, man. I'm, I'm, I'm sweating. What, um, one last thing. I still have those faith shoes. I still have the faith shoes as my testimony because when people see me drive what I drive and live where I live in and the multiple businesses, I like, I, I have to, you know, take them to a place to say, no, 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 no. It wasn't given to me. It wasn't given to me. You got it. It was a growing into these places and there's farther to go. I love you. I love you. I love you. Keep your faith shoes, this though. That's all of us I have. Often, often have our producer to mute you. <laughs> uh, man. Keep it rolling. Derek, um, Bishop Derek McGee, man. Uh, you, I don't know. It's, um, it's your <laughs> turn. Um, just tell me, uh, what was the transition point? Because one thing you said earlier is about, like, uh, you didn't grow up in a family that had a lot of entrepreneurs. So now I got to be what I didn't see. Mm -hmm. um, someone didn't, someone didn't, you know, say, hey, do this, do step one, step two, step three. You was a trailblazer in a lot of ways. And one of my favorite uh, quotes is by Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, do not go where the path may lead, but instead go and leave a trail. And so, uh, Darren McGee, you can go in and kind of share what that transition point was for you. Um. Wow. So I, th I think when I started taking it seriously, two things happened almost simultaneously. The first was I kept trying to thrust somebody else to go on something that I heard God telling me to do. Um, and because I didn't feel like I was qualified to do it, I was trying to convince somebody else to do it. What really got me serious about it I mean, like really committed to the work was was just the 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 intensity of the opposition. Right. It, it was just it was it was aggressive. And I, I remember my grandmother when I was growing up, she would always say to us, if they're not talking about you, you ain't doing nothing. And so for me, it really got to that point where I remember praying one night to the Lord and asking God, why is all this going on? Why me? Why me? Why me? And because we are men of faith, you know, we I can say this and you guys understand it. But Spirit of the Lord responded back and said, why not you? Why not you? And, and it is in that conversation and me receiving that, that I came to the realization of, brother, you can't outrun this. You can't try to assign somebody as your substitute. You got to now embrace what's happening. And in that embracing, I fully understood that, man, listen, to before God ever elevates, he always isolates. He always isolates. And, and for me, that was the best thing ever was God isolating me. God worked on me. God spent a lot of time on me before he even put me to do anything. And this wasn't about me being put out there for ministry or anything else. It was my heart's desire was, God, whatever you're doing, I want to make sure that the way I walk and, and what I do does not does not reflect back on you in embarrassment. You know, and so so everything else that came 
and, and I'm not naive, right? The things that the Lord has favored me tremendously to be able to do. I, I, I know it's God's glory, but I also know that God has deemed me trustworthy enough to be able to, to be entrusted with these things. And so when I started realizing and really and really seeing the opposition, I'm talking about even from the saints, right? It, it was because because here's what I, I, I made the mistake of. I made the mistake of believing that God actually would honor his word. I made that mistake and I'm being sarcastic when I say that, but I'm also being serious. I made the mistake of reading the Bible and believing that what God said in his word, God would do it. And I say that because there were people I was going to church with who I was sitting amongst on regular on Sundays who began to criticize me and speak ill of me because I was holding God to his word. They were just going and I was believing. And, and listen, now I said it to you earlier. I didn't grow up with money. Right. We grew up very impoverished. My mom did the best she could to raise her two boys. But we struggled financially. And I don't care what anybody tell you. I never enjoy being broke. Never enjoyed having to borrow from anybody. Never enjoyed, you know, being in a grocery line with food stamps. Never enjoyed, you know, having to go and and, and get just cheese or get just butter. Never enjoyed having to wear somebody else's clothes that they outgrew. None of that stuff made me feel good. Now, it's a testimony, but I didn't enjoy any of that. And so I'm not ever going to lie to nobody and say I didn't enjoy any of it. Now, it, it, stripped, it strengthened me. But in that regard... Um, what I also understood was my seriousness is necessary because if 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 I allow God to birth the vision he gave me, others can eat off of it. A vision should not only feed you. People, other people should be eating off that vision. And now I have we have two children, right? My son is 16. We have many conversations, right? And I'm able to have genuine discussion with my son about things called life. And he asked me questions that because I didn't throw in the towel early on, I now can answer those questions through experience, through experience. Pastor Brown was talking earlier about, you know, he wish he had asked his dad the tough questions, right? When he was saying, I started thinking about that with my son, because if I had quit early when, when it, when it was tumultuous in the opposition, he would never have the benefit. He would never have the benefit of, of having those conversations. But brothers, I will tell you, you know, I got tired of, of going to bed crying at night because I didn't understand why so much opposition. Well, I'm just trying to do right. I'm just literally, God, you said this. I believe you said it. I'm holding you to it and I'm launching out on it. Why is that creating friction? Why, why is that an issue? And the Lord gave me, told me to give me a vision to launch the church that I now pastor for the last 11 years. Man, if I told you the amount of saints that that literally, literally just just wrote me off. I had I had local pastors who wouldn't even invite me to their church no more because they were led to believe that I had just left as a, dis, a disgruntled preacher, so on and so forth. And I was just obeying what God said. That's all I was doing. We started our church in, in 2010 with three members. And those were, those were my wife and my two children. That was it. That was it. But here's the thing. I gave God a yes. And my yes was not contingent upon a certain number of members. It was a yes based on God, God giving a vision. And so I got serious, man, when I realized that there was nothing I was going to be able to do to make the people talking about me stop talking about me. They was going to talk regardless. And so I got serious to realize, you know what, if you, if you want to talk about me, OK, I'm going to do something with the help of God so radical and so awesome you're going to have something to talk about. And so if you're going to talk, let me give you real things to talk about. And I'm not saying it's easy. Lord knows I'm not saying it's easy. I have in, in the political process, most rooms that I'm in, some of you can attest to this, most rooms I'm in, I'm the only black in that room, right? I'm the only one. So you talk about being a trendsetter. It's not easy being the first fruit of anything, right? When you're the first one in your family to do anything, it's not easy at all. You're literally taking all the wounds, all the slaps, all the bruises, but you would think about our forefathers and our foremothers and all they went through in slavery, man. They did it. And the songs they sang was because they believed in the heaven, but also they were enduring it for us. Right. They were doing it for us. And so it's not easy being the first fruit. Right. It's not easy being the trendsetter. But 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 at the same point, there's others who will come after you in that regard. So I think about my children now. I'm going to conclude this way. Mr. T.D. Jake said this years ago, and I hold fast to it. 
And he said, your blessing is your children's normal, right? My children have never known financial struggle. They have never known how it is to go to bed without eating. They've never known how it is to go in a closet and only have a pair of shoes for school and a pair of shoes for, for church. They don't know what that is. Right. So 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 living comfortable is their normal. But living comfortable is my blessing, because as as Bishop Smith said, I remember when when you literally all I had was 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 one black suit jacket, three pair of slacks, two white shirts, two ties. I'm trying to interchange them on Sundays. Look like I look like something. All my stuff looking too big. But but I was dressing for where I was going. I remember not having enough money in the bank just to be able to eat. I remember going, I remember eating nothing but ramen noodles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner on multiple days. I remember those occasions. I, re I remember writing on a tithe envelope at Tabernacle that, that saying, Lord, I don't have enough money to put in this envelope, but I'm believing that you're going to manifest something so great. And I promise you that when you give it to me, I will give you back more than the tithe is. Than the tithe is. I remember those things. People thought I was crazy. But guess what? Them same people who thought I was crazy back then since have found themselves calling and asking me, how did you do it? And what I tell them, I was just, I just believe God at his word. I didn't believe God at his word. And that was the thing, man, is I was not going to be a preacher. I was not going to be a pastor. I was not going to be a Christian who was going to recite somebody's cliche. I was going, I was, I'm going to say what thus saith the Lord and God, I'm going to hold you to your word. Jesus in Matthew four said it this way. It is written. And if Jesus can recite the word and it worked, I'm going to do the same exact thing. So that's when I got serious, man. When I realized, do you spend so much energy trying to appease the people and you're going home empty and miserable? Let's stop doing that. Let's get locked in and get serious and watch what God, watch how God does things in, in a major way. And if they're going to talk, they're going to talk. But, but, but as they're talking, most people who talk, brothers, they're talking from a place of stagnant. They're standing still talking about you. Right. They're at a distance talking about you. But when you're doing work, Jake's in a book talked about the difference between giraffes and turtles. Right. When you are when you are a visionary, you are giraffe. Giraffes are never seen conversing with turtles. If a giraffe drops his head too long, he will pass out because giraffe's not designed to have his head that low. He's just, he lives and eats at a certain level. So if a giraffe is conversing with a turtle, that means that giraffe came down from his natural place to stoop down to a lower place. And so when you are a visionary, you got to make up in your mind, I am not going to find myself dwelling in mediocrity because I can't survive there. I'm going to suffocate at that level because I can't do mediocrity. I remember I remember Otis when he was at Innovation and he then started his own. I remember all that. I remember listening to his faith speaking and seeing it now, seeing multiple locations. I'm not surprised. But I remember when he was speaking that when he was just starting it all over again. Right. But I just dared to believe God in his word, man. I got serious about it. And, I, and I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a um, word of mouth preacher. I'm not naming and claiming it. I'm just saying, Lord, in your words, you said this. You know what? I'm going to trust you on this. I'm going to believe that you that this is what you actually said. I'm going to do it. And as I kept doing that, man, I started seeing God do great things. And and, and the result, God has blessed me to be the first generation in the family to do a lot of things. But not just for me. Right. I got to make sure that others ought to be able to eat off of that. And God gets all the glory from it. And this snippet thing is hard, brother. You know, Otis got the whole thing hey, started. man. I don't, hey, hey, look, oh, uh, Lord, have mercy. What, whatever is in the well going to come up in the water. February 5th. Brother, so, February, yeah, February 5th, man. We just y'all oh, been bringing some pails so we can dip that <laughs> water up out to get you uh, filled. Um, last y'all, no, last three gonna answer this question, then we're gonna close out. Um, uh, Dr. Brown, Kenneth Brown, um, uh, tell me what your transition point. I mean, I really love it. I mean, I, I'm trying to, I, it's, it's hard for me to not even get feedback. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kenneth Brown, tell me, man, what uh, what was your transition point of going from practice, um, going from just knowing, um, knowing as in and in, in, in a phrase. And transition over to practice about vision. I'm not just saying this thing. I'm actually going to do it. Yeah, I, I've always been the quiet one, um, always in the background. Uh, you know, uh, just just that type of guy. And so, what happened for me was, I, mean, I feel like I've always been a late bloomer. Um, and so, how I transitioned from from uh, phrase to practice, or I like to, as I like to call it, from 
from potential to performance mm. uh, was I surrounded myself around people that have been in life where I was, but they were in life where I was trying to go. And so my uncle always taught me, he said, if you are always the bigger person in the room, then you're hanging around too many small people. So I had to surround myself. I had to make myself uncomfortable many times. I had to surround myself around people, great people that knew more than me, but they they experienced in life what some some hard things that I can go talk to them about, but they were in life where I was trying to go to, you know, uh, whether it was financially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, uh, you know, uh, surrounding myself around uh, great men such as these men around here, you know, uh, that we're in such as yourself, you know, my brothers just surrounding myself. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable, but watch this. The, the, it gave me a lot of inspiration, motivation. I was motivated. You know, I was inspired. It woke something up in me. And so uh, that's how I went from potential to performance. Cause see, everybody has the potential to do, you know, uh, but how many actually, how many people actually perform what we say we're going to do? And so that's what, it, and that, that's just to, mm -hmm. I know we got two other people, so I'm, I'm going to be short. Woo. That's good, brother. Potential to performance. Um, man, um, you remember when I, I tell my son, he don't say this no more, but he used to say, I said, why you didn't clean your room? You know, his response was, I can clean my room. <laughs> I said, I'm not talking about ability. I'm talking about opportunity. <laughs> Did you take the opportunity to use your ability in the right place and right time to complete the job? That's what I hear you say, Brown. So, um, Pastor Young, um, you're a little bit everywhere um, with locations. You're planted everywhere, but I know you're standing on God's word. I know you're in the season of God's favor. That's the theme for the year. Um, so uh, unpack that. Um, tell me what was the transition um, for you to say, you know what? My, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm kind of scratch you a little bit. My faith has already been tested, but this time I'm going to try it in a different capacity. Yes, sir. <laughs> Because it's one thing to have faith in a system that was already created for you. But you stepped outside of that. <laughs> Trust God and allow God to allow God to give you a system for yourself, your ministry, your school, your everything. That's a different type of faith, Doc. That's a different yes, type of faith there, Doc. Uh, so what what was the transition point to say, you know what? You know, because we can be real good at being in systems. We can be really good at being yes, repetition sir. and religious. Um, you know, people go to church religiously. They go to certain systems religiously. But that well, faith has not been tested, have not been tried. And I, so I know you have been in a great position to transition. Have it been easy? No. Um, so just unpack that. What was the transition point for you that's going from that? I'm not just saying this is uh, one faith, one God, one baptism. I'm not saying yes. that. I know for sure in practice. Yes, sir. I think for me, you know, transition is inevitable. Transition is needed. And whenever there's a transition, most times God is trying to elevate us. And so the test comes not for us to fail, but to promote us. I think for me, from going from vision to manifestation by Prophet Price, and it came in two things. I went through a mental meta, 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 metamorphosis in my mind where I began to say to myself, I, I, self, you won't, you can't fail. Because in my mind, I, I, I was thinking about past things. And once I got delivered in my mind from the, uh, the need from public, public opinion and public approval. Uh, and once I got delivered in my mind from self-concept concerning myself, a way I thought, and when I, I began to see myself through the eyes of faith and see myself through the realm of the spirit, how God saw me, then I began to say, I cannot fail because God cannot fail and greater see this with on the inside of me. And so I think there was a mental metam metamorphosis that caused a language change, which ties into what Bishop Ty Smith and so began to change. So when my words began to change, my language changed, my atmosphere began to change. And I made up in my mind just in 
2022, guess what? My declaration is producing my manifestation. And so what I began to decree and declare because it has to yet manifest because that now faith is not not now faith was, but now faith is. And so there was a, a, a there, there was a mind change concerning oldest young uh, of, of who he is in Christ. There was a there was a there was a, there was a transformation that says I got I trust you at your word and I'm moving forward. And I, I what I've seen what I've done for others, what I did for my spiritual father, Pastor Leland, what I did for 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 18 years for another ministry. God, you are working now on my behalf and I see it for myself. Mental metamorphosis. Doc, you up here sound like an Avenger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Don't say that, man. And then you said my declaration. What's that? You said my declaration. It's producing um, manifestation. It's producing. So you saying what I say? Yes, sir. Is what I can see? Yes, sir. <laughs> Listen, watch, watch out, wow. Metaverse. Watch out, Metaverse. The mental <laughs> metamorphosis is coming to the Metaverse. Oh, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Look at him. I told him to sit back. Y'all, y'all, somebody better. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, Bishop Chester Brown, are you still folding in? Bishop. Yes, sir. I'm, 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 I'm going right to press mute you. on my on, on this um, iPad. And I'm going to try my hardest not to unmute it. Um, but tell me what was the transition point? Just a little bit um, that I know for sure was you are such an anointed man of God that you were so authentic. I, the one thing that I love about you that you didn't conform to what was comfortable among religious systems. When I say you challenge, you went the the, the let me say this joke of preached one sermon. He said the difference between swelling and growing. I don't, I don't even want to get in that. I don't even want to get into that, Doc. Both of them just ex expand, but one of them actually actually develop. Doc, I, hey, listen, but so I want to get into that. But go ahead, Doc. Um, yeah, uh, it's a great question, uh, and I, I have just uh, I've been feasting off of uh, all the other uh, pastors and leaders uh, who have been uh, just uh, sharing on this uh, fact of the transition point uh, when it comes to vision. For me, what was the transition point? Not just saying it, but um, you know the transition. I'm going to do it. I I um I realized that God started early with me as a teenager, um, preparing me on the backside of the mountain. Um, and I found that my quiet time was my most valuable time, um, because the quiet time is where I found myself as uh, Bishop Ty uh, Ty Smith to say dreaming. I found myself, you know, envisioning stuff. I, I, I um, and then as uh, Dr. Venice was saying earlier, uh, on a couple of the first rounds when they were talking, and that's when inside of me, uh, stuff started manifesting. Um, and so that quiet time, I could see stuff. I could see stuff. I could, I, I was doing like daydreaming. I can, I can close my eyes and see it and envision stuff and then open my eyes and see something in the middle of nothing. So again, on the backside of the mountain, the Lord's preparing me, preparing me. And so as I continue to, to, to be exposed, that became another area of uh, the transition, another part of the transition. So now God is exposing me. I'm, 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 I'm in this arena. I'm in that arena. I'm around this uh, bright mind. I'm, I'm being challenged by this person. I've been here. I've been in this atmosphere. I've felt that. I've seen that. I participated with that. And so I ended up with a equation that I lived by. I started living by. And that equation was uh, exposure breeds expectancy and expectancy births and experience exposure breed when you're exposed it now breeds expectation expectancy and now with your expectation it now births an experience now so what god did with me is he took me and started early with my visions putting me in crisis 
I don't know how to live without a crisis right now. Now, I'm, I'm, finna, I'm finna go back because the first major crisis on the vision of ministry and work happened at Greensboro High School. So Bishop Ty uh, Smith can attest to this. So what happens is crisis that I'm put in now with the exposure that I have, now it the crisis puts a, a demand on my supply, if I make any sense. It puts a demand on my supply that, that through the exposure I have now gained a supply. Some of it I know of and some of it I don't know until it's tapped into, until there is a demand on it. And so now, you know, my first major job is Greensboro High School band program that had laid line dormant for four years. And when I got there and showed up for the job, they gave me some chalk, an eraser, and some keys that said, you know where the band room is, go do it. And so now I'm now walking around and I'm spending time back in my quiet time. And I'm just dreaming. I'm looking and seeing. I'm dreaming. I'm going out on the football field and I'm dreaming. I can see it. So now with the, with the dreaming and the vision I have, I was with the vision. I knew the vision was from God. So I wasn't trying to get a vision from God. Because if God give you a vision, why don't you give God a plan? You wait on God. No, God then gave you a vision, what the end result's going to be. Well, then in return, do God a favor and give him a plan. So I started putting pieces together. Okay, well, I need this. I got to do this. Well, I need to bring this together. I need to do that. And not knowing and not realizing that that work at Greensboro High School was preparing me to go pastor a church that was a first and third Sunday church on Chairs Crossroad as far east as you can go in the city of Tallahassee, still have a Tallahassee zip code with a, with a sheep pasture on one side and, and, and goats on the other side and a graveyard behind you. And, and now a first and third Sunday church uh, that had about, had about 50 members active. And so now transform this. It's a crisis. And I'm there late at night, sitting in the pulpit, and I can see stuff. I see it. I can see it. So now let me give God a plan. I'm out there walking around the land saying, okay, this, this, okay, I'm not, okay, okay, I see this. And I'm saying, God, how are we going to do this? And God's saying, remember what I told you. Remember, just follow me. And so, man, I'm, I'm, that stuff is, man, and it's so, it's crisis. I get to Charlotte. And so Chairs Crossroad then prepared me for another major crisis. Don't look at the building. Forget about the building. It ain't about no building. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not called to pinnacles. I'm called to valleys. I'm called to go into valleys, and 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 I have accepted that as as um, apostle uh, as apostle said just a moment ago. Uh, man, I, I this is what I've been assigned to. Man, this this is my life. I, I even re, even revivals I've done. I used to cry about doing revivals. Man, I, I'm doing 15, 20 revivals a year. I'm like, man, when I'm going to get the big time revival? When am I going to get the revival that, you know, everything's laid out? Lord, I ain't called you to that. I call you to valley ministry. And so I call you to crisis because crisis puts a demand on your supply, man. And that's the transitional, man, let me hush. Man. That's the transitional moment. That's the transitional moment that transitions your atmosphere because it also transitions you even more. And so I'm here in Charlotte, man, and it's a crisis since the day I walked in the, in the door. It's a beautiful people, wonderful people. Everywhere I've been has been wonderful people. But crisis, because I'm called to. Okay, this is a this is what this is one of our national churches. I can care less. I'm not impressed by your building. Neither am I impressed by the dormant where you sit on on right downtown, the only black church that's down. Am I still? You went out. You, you went out on the stair, Pastor Brown. But I, I, we still got your picture. Um, but we can't hear you visually. We can't hear you. Can everybody else hear him, or is that there just? Is. Some... There it is. Say something now. Mm -mm. It's a crisis. But went out again. Mm, mm, mm. Lord have mercy. Okay. Um, it was too powerful. He, he, yeah. He, I mean, his. That was his, enough with the snippet. Too powerful. And to hear him talk about crisis 
Um, that's, you know, that's one of the spaces I absolutely embrace because I, I, I absolutely believe that's where you learn the most. I believe that's where the most opportunity sits. And I, I believe that once you embrace it and understand that the lessons are rare, then it's hard to find those lessons that you find during crisis. And, and that's where leaders are really born. And that's where we really test it. And if, if you're not comfortable in crisis, I'm not sure how you call yourself a leader. So true words there, Pastor Brown. Hopefully you come back in and finish your finish your statement. I am back. I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I, I want to hear some of the other pastors. Y'all, I love y'all, man. I, I'm enjoying this. And, now, uh, that's that's it. They got, they got to get in this. I'm, I'm glad you said it. Um, that's it for the snippet. Um, now we now we done gave them a lot more than what they asked for. Uh, however, um, you guys, man, uh, I don't I don't know, man. Um, I'm truly excited um, to be able to that allow God to show me who to bring on to unfold this um, this vision. Those who have been through some things, those who actually doing some great things, those people don't mind sharing from a humble place, sharing how they got where they are and. Um, I'm not saying the process and things of that regard. Um, and remember, this is only a snippet. So I'm not really trying to do a pitch. It's like you, you, if you enjoy what you heard tonight, um, just think about having a conversation with these guys in person, having a conversation with other like-minded individuals. Um, this is our second annual. I'm going to say annual because each and every year, um, that is the goal to ensure that we grow bigger and better. Um, each year, February 5th, 2022, um, you'll see all these gentlemen there. Um, and we're going to have a great time. Um, tickets can be uh, purchased uh, through the link that is going to be on my page, link that's on this uh, this video as well. Uh, and you can DM me. Just men. Just men. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, and this is a men gathering. Um, <laughs> the women y'all had to snip it tonight. Uh, <laughs> it's a men gathering, not to uh, to block out the women in no capacity. But uh, I, I prior to this event, I've never heard an event like this, particularly targeting men. Um, so I, I, so we had to had to do something out of the box, out of the norm. Um, so definitely would love for anybody to uh, tag along, come in. I got a list of people who've already had, um, purchased tickets. Um, so I'm excited about that. So um, other than that, you guys have a great, great evening. I do apologize. I, 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 I know, I know, I do apologize. Uh, um, but I will not perish. These guys said so much stuff. I'm going to sleep good tonight. These guys so much said so much. I hope um, our producer recorded it so you can go back and Listen to it later on and get all this. These guys, a wealth of knowledge and experience and all of that. They they just said so much, man. Um, Bishop Tyrone Smith, he don't know how to sit down in his seat. Bishop Brown, so cool with the beard. Uh, Rick Rawson showed up here, man. Pastor went from the car to the inside of the house. Dr. Uh, <laughs> Vinnizzi, I'm telling you, man, that joke was a spoke, the call, the, you know, the, uh, uh, Derek McGee, man, he's talking about how he had to, you know, work on some things and characters, culture, all that good stuff from the highs of the seven. He started at a low point, all that stuff. Had to block out all that stuff. The blessing and departure. Um, Dr. Franklin, um, the beautiful thing that he said is about um, education. You know, education don't have to happen in the classroom. We we have our phone and our, <laughs> our tablets, everything else. He didn't wait uh, to sign up for a class. He educated himself to start the journey and to change the direction of, you know, you want to do something different. Um, and test the Brown doc. I'm almost glad that your stuff interrupted. Now I'm just be honest. I'm glad it was interrupted. Um, any last words, um, you guys that you want to say to the end of the thing, everybody got one minute. This is a power minute. This one sixty seconds. I would say seconds. I, I would quickly say, hey, uh, you know, I, I know we're we're not uh, inviting the sisters in, but I would encourage you to to send your sons, send your your husbands, uh, send, send the man out. I, I guarantee you we're going to we're going to drop some knowledge. Um, 
just the synergy on this call and the experience and leadership on this call alone has fed me and been been one of the most powerful me meetings I've had this year. So I can only imagine what the energy going to be like in the building on February 5th. Send your folks out. Uh, this is some powerful stuff. It, it made a tremendous difference in my life. And it's the reason some of this stuff we're talking about is the reason why I stand here today. And, and I'm certainly not someone who should be standing here. So send, send your folks out. Thank you. I would simply say, for you know, we, we tend to always look at the price tag of something and make a decision whether or not we're going to participate. My response simply is equate to $25 to a seed. And, and then and let this seed be what you 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 sow a seed to to what you want to see next. I mean, all of our experiences equip us to be able to be part of what we're doing, to be able to sow to other people. And as you as we learned tonight, I mean, no matter how how good you are in your craft and God has blessed you, you can still receive from somebody else. But as men, as men, you know, we have to understand, man you got to be doing something for somebody to want to follow you right and you got to be willing to put yourself in those situations where you can receive and it's something about when men come together right it's a safe space but it's also a challenging place and we got to be challenged um, in that regard and so i'm encouraging all all that and as as my brother dr o said for the ladies you know do yourself a favor you 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 sow the seed on behalf of your husband your boyfriend your sons your nephews things of that nature and, and then make sure they get there make sure they get there thank you brother anybody else had any last words um i know dr gallup franklin gonna say something i'm everybody else gonna say something <laughs> <laughs> If you're asking me to chime in, I definitely can. I'll, I'll say $25 is a lot less money and uh, time and effort than probably us collectively had to pay and endure to have the knowledge that we all do have. And so I would say if I if I could uh, pay 25 bucks instead of the time and, and the money that we've all endure, endured to uh, get the type of knowledge that we have over time, would we're doing a heartbeat. So don't let that discourage you. For sure. And, you know, I want to say something that uh, Bishop Smith was talking about in reference to Abraham. And one powerful piece when he was talking about Abraham and, and what God promised him was also the amount of time between the promise and the delivery of the promise. And I mean, I, I it was when he was talking about that thing. I was like, man, it was just so powerful because there was even and you know what? Never mind. Like, February 5th. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been out here for hour and 28 minutes. We'll, we'll keep it rolling. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going we to call. That, that's, that's Bishop Gallup. <laughs> you got an honorary of the night. Uh, Pastor Young, um, give me give me 60 seconds of whatever you want to say last minute to either us as the um, people online, the viewers, or whatever. Yeah, I'll say this. I got give me, give me 55. OK, pay 55. That a double favor. I will pay you back with it's not just a C, but it's an investment. I do real estate and some things you just have to invest in and you will see a good return on the investment. You don't sometimes don't see it in the front end, but you see it on the back end. So make an investment in your prophetic destiny and you'll see a definite return. I sense in the realm of the spirit that many have some things that are on the inside of them. And it's going to be a Mary and Elizabeth situation that when you come in the very presence, that which has been on the inside of you is going to begin to leaping and begin to turn. And so when you come into the presence of the men and come on February 5th, there is something that's going to be ignited on the inside of you that you will not be able to explain, but it's got it's, it's, it's greatness attached to it. So meet me on February 5th. <laughs> that was 48 seconds. Okay. Bishop Kenneth Brown. See you February 5th. <laughs> He's petty. I just wanted to know. That's always my brother. He's petty. He's <laughs> uh, Mr. Tyrone Smith. All right. Uh, February 5th, second out. month. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it easy. Uh, I'm, I'm so humble and thankful for all of you um, as, as brothers in Christ uh, being the example, us coming together. We often talk about how uh, the community should come together, but the Bible talks about 
um, how um, um, judgment begins at the house of faith. All right. Um, and so at the end of the day, it, it, it's up to us to be the example. Uh, God bless Nick Fryson and his whole house. Uh, yes. Be blessed yes. for opening such a door and being that that glue um, that's connected to all of us so we can come together and serve our community and serve future generations in this way. I'm absolutely humbled to sit before such great men and share um, as the Lord has given us. And so two, five, that's the second month of the year, the fifth day. All right. Two plus five makes seven. I believe it's a completion showing up, a completion in the hearts of men when we show up and touch and agree. I love you. We'll see you on the fifth. You had one job, man. <laughs> one job. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pastor Justin Brown, just stop at the light. Just stop at the light. Man, I'm at the light right now. <laughs> and uh, let me just say, I am made better because of being on this uh, video stream with these amazing, gifted, anointed men of God. And I'm just humbled to be a part. And um, this, this is epic. This is something that um that our our region and area and Tallahassee area need and um I'm grateful to be a part of this so much so that I'm going to do a video inviting all of my Facebook Instagram followers to you know come to Tallahassee all brothers listen you got to be here what has happened tonight is so rich among us and there's nothing but an overflow that could take place on the 5th and so I'm a part of it. We're a part of it. And uh, I'm going to be praying. And I'm coming also not only to feed, but I'm also coming to eat myself. I'm, I'm not only coming to pour out, I'm coming to receive. Okay. And, uh, and I'm encouraging everyone else to do it. I, $25 is, is, is nothing. It, it is the one, one of the greatest seeds you can sow in this season. And so let's do it. Let's rally our base. And let's see the, manif the, the the great manifesting power of God in his hand and deliverance, I believe. I is our portion going to take place. So God bless you. Oof, Shabbat. Now, young ladies, I will say this to you. Um, there's a part that you can play in this, but not besides just sowing the seed of um, getting your sons and your husband come. Now, if you want to hear Pastor Chester Brown, he going to actually be here on that Friday that night. Yes, sir. At the kingdom. Yes, sir. Um, and you see how he cutting up. Um, I I, I couldn't put y'all at the church. Uh, that's all I'm saying. You know, we got to go out in somebody's yard or something. <laughs> uh, Friday night at uh, Kingdom Life Tabernacle, uh, my church, my home church. Um, we definitely will be, um, Pastor Chester Brown will be there at 7, 7.30 um, start time. You can come get that word. Now, you can come to that uh <laughs> yourself so uh other than that you guys i really appreciate you guys yielding the time tonight um it was everything that i wanted and i prayed god for um i know hearts and minds and spirits have been touched in a great positive way uh look forward to uh just being in the same room um so again if you want to buy tickets um you can um you can message me directly at link in the bio uh, if you don't want to put your card on there, you can use Cash App, Apple Pay, all these things and uh, put your name in the memo and we will definitely make sure that we uh, put your uh, names on the list. But other than that, you guys have a great evening and we will talk to you soon. Remember that date, February 5th, 2022 at Tallahassee Community College and Workforce Development Center. Have a great evening.